Uh, let's go ahead and uh, go to my guest for the day. Um, joining me now to discuss a new study published in the journal Nature Communications uh, concerning the growth of mosquito populations in several states is the lead author, Dr. Marm Kilpatrick. Uh, Dr. Kilpatrick is an associate professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Santa Cruz in California. Dr. Kilpatrick, welcome, sir, to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Yes, sir. Okay, well, you're, I found your study incredibly interesting, and the findings um, of your research will likely come as a surprise to many uh, who believe the conventional wisdom that says that the mosquito population increases and the spread of mosquitoes are due to rising temperatures or climate change. Uh, in fact, you point to two important factors. It's the residual DDT and uh, what you call urbanization. And we'll get in, we'll get into that a little bit later in the in the interview. But let's go ahead and start with uh, why did you and your colleagues want to look at this issue? Is there something? Is this something that hasn't been studied before? So we actually were looking into this issue for the reason you raised, which was that we wondered if mosquito populations over the last eight or 10 uh, decades, so actually about 80 years, have been driven primarily by climate change or other factors. And we initially thought we would find what you, what most people actually think, which is that rising temperatures would be the primary cause of changes in mosquito populations. But when we dug into the data and looked at it really carefully, what we saw instead was that um, mosquito populations in all three states we looked at, which was New York, New Jersey, and California, basically had relatively high populations in the 1930s and 40s. And then when DDT started to be used for both agriculture and mosquito control, populations crashed of mosquitoes in all these three different areas, and then were actually quite low, both in the number of mosquito species that you could find in a given place and the abundance of those mosquitoes for about 15 or 20 years. And then the mosquito populations only started recovering once DDT use ceased and the, the concentration of DDT in the environment started to slowly wane over time. And the patterns that we saw were that although mosquito species numbers have increased and the numbers of mosquitoes of each individual species of so mosquito abundance increased quite a bit over the last four decades, these rises in mosquito populations were not in fact due to rising temperatures, but in fact the decay of DDT in the environment and as you noted earlier, increasing populations of humans, which we believe um, dr drives changes in the landscape, so urbanization of the landscapes and the resulting effects on mosquito populations themselves. Yeah, I mean, what is the half-life of DDT? Because it appears it stays in the environment for some period of time. And it, and so on, it, it appears it's surprising to you how long it was effective. So, yeah, so on the order of decades is basically how long it can persist in the environment. Um, and the exact rates depend on all kinds of uh, chemical processes. That uh, is not my area of expertise. But gotcha. in this study, we actually were able to get data on DDT concentrations in soil cores um, from a number of, of lakes and other wetlands around the U.S., and we were able to actually track the concentration of DDT. And in fact, uh, DDT concentrations in the environment peaked in the 60s when DDT was being used heavily, but it was actually not gone. It was still detectable in the environment through the late 1990s in New York, um, and the same actually in New Jersey as well, and decayed a little bit earlier in California. So it was less, we didn't pick it up in the environment so much after uh, the 1980s. And so uh, the fact that this chemical that had such an enormous impact on both mosquito populations and other insects, as well as obviously the cascading effects that I think many of your listeners will be familiar with, like birds, um, bald eagles, osprey, things like that. Uh, the fact that this chemical can last in the environment for decades after its last use is really quite impressive to us. And uh, did, did you also see the same effect on other arthropods like ticks and, and the like? In this study, we actually only looked at mosquito populations. Gotcha. And the main reason for that is that um, my collaborators on this project, um, Ilya uh, Ilya Roklin, um, Ari Faraji, and Chris Barker, as well as Dominic, um, were all work for mosquito control agencies. And so they actually um, had access to these data records going back, uh, in one case, a little over 80 years, and in another case, uh, a little over 50 years. And so to be able to have these long-term data records is what was required for us really to pull out the patterns that we found. Okay, can, can you describe the study in a little bit more detail um, as far as like the methods and in how you came to the conclusion that it really wasn't temperature? Sure, absolutely. So what we basically did was that um, uh, several counties in each one of these three states, California, New York, and New Jersey, have had mosquito control programs in place um, for the last 80 
80 years in the eastern part of the U.S., New York, New Jersey, and the last 50 or 60 years in California. And they've actually been trapping mosquitoes with the exact same type of mosquito trap for that long period of time, which allows us to know that the changes in mosquito populations aren't simply due to, let's say, a more effective type of mosquito trap. Um, and so that gives us these long-term records of mosquito abundances for each of the different mosquito species that are found in each of these regions. And so we basically had this time series or these patterns of changes in mosquito populations over time. And we then simply also found data on the temperatures in the surrounding area, which we got from meteorological records. Um, GDT uh, concentrations in the environment were taken from um, a publication that had gone to a bunch of lakes and wetlands, as I mentioned earlier, and taken soil cores and measured the concentration of various different chemicals in the environment. Um, and we took the, data, the DDT data from those studies. We also got data on um, on precipitation, so just kind of yearly changes in, in rainfall and other types of precipitation. Mm -hmm. And then we also got data from each one of these regions on, on populations, so just the human population in the kind of surrounding county. And that was our measure of kind of the changes in land use, which we thought would be associated with uh, human population growth. Yeah. And we basically – what? sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, sir. So then we simply had these uh, three time series or kind of records over time of mosquitoes, climate measures, and human population size. And we performed some analyses that basically look for correlations among those variables that also account for other properties of the time series to try to find which of these um, kind of variables is most likely to be correlated or most likely to be causally related to mosquitoes themselves. And with all these types of observational studies, it's hard to make really strong causal conclusions because, of course, there could be some third measured variable that we haven't come up with that that's also important here. But given the patterns in the data, which are really quite striking, um, we feel relatively con confident in suggesting that DDT was a major cause of a crash in mosquito populations in the 50s and 60s, and then a subsequent rise afterwards. And the data also have a pretty strong signal that um, another variable that kind of has increased linearly over this time, so from the 40s up to the current day, which uh, urbanization or human population size uh, fits this pattern quite well, that also appears to be quite important in explaining these patterns. Yeah, can, can you explain to my audience what you mean by urbanization? Sure. So, um, so urbanization is simply, you know, a word to describe the kind of conversion of other types of habitats, so either forests in the eastern part of the U.S. or in other places it could be grasslands or prairies, into um, kind of built-up environments. So putting in buildings and roads and parking lots and all, all those types of structures that we kind of replace natural habitats with. That's what we use. That's, that's what we mean when we say urbanization. Okay, so some, some mosquitoes that may be found in swamplands would be eliminated, but there are mosquitoes that are found in urban areas. So, I mean... Precisely. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly right. Uh, right. And in fact, your readers will be actually quite familiar with a couple species that have been in the news quite quite a lot lately, which are Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. Of course. And these are the two dominant mosquitoes that are involved in the transmission of Zika virus. And these two mosquitoes actually do extremely well in habitats created by humans. So they, Aedes aegypti, actually both species in particular, like um, habitats like tires, they like bird baths, they like trash containers, any sort of small container that holds water, that's ideal habitat for these types of mosquitoes. And uh, a perfect environment would be the urban environment of Miami. Yes, perfectly. Yeah. Okay, now... <sighs> The, the the fascinating thing about this is, I mean, I got a quote here from a climate scientist from the Environmental Defense Fund, and she says the links between mosquitoes and temperatures are scientifically clear. Um, so I, I guess my question for you, uh, Dr. Kilpatrick, is uh, why why do you believe that climate change was not a factor in your study? So we were actually surprised ourselves, and I think what we should say is that it is very clear that temperature has a substantial impact on mosquitoes. There's no question about that. The larger question is if you say, okay, if you look at a period of time, so in this case the last 50 to 80 years, and you say what is the major factor responsible for changes in mosquito populations over that period of time, and the answer is that although temperature – has some influences on mosquito populations and certainly does year to year, you know, the, the kind of annual cycles of mosquitoes, both sure. in terms of rainfall and temperature, those patterns are, you know, really, really clear. There's no disputing any of that. But over the same period of time, basically the, the fluctuations in mosquito populations are not consistent with the changes in mosquito, sorry, in the, the changes in temperature, but are in fact very consistent with the changes in both DDT and things like urbanization or land use. And so, uh, so we're not suggesting that climate change will have no impact on mosquitoes. What we're instead suggesting is that over this last period of time, this last five to eight decades, a much larger um, uh, factor in mosquito populations has been land use and chemical use, especially sure. DDT use. Right, right. Now, in, in, the, in the study, I also saw that you discussed um, the issue of temperatures and when they, ma and when they matter um, when it comes to mosquitoes, uh, ver you know, hot versus cold. Can you uh, just explain that a little bit? 
Sure, yeah. So we think that um, this temperature affects mosquitoes in a number of different ways, but the most important ones are that increasing temperatures uh, basically speed up how fast different aspects of mosquitoes' lives happen. So they um, they start out as eggs. How long it takes those eggs to go from hatching to small larvae and then turn into an adult, which bites, that period gets shorter and shorter the higher the temperatures are. So that part of the life cycle speeds up. In addition, once they become an adult and the females, which are the only ones that feed on, on blood, they take a blood meal, they digest that blood, they lay a batch of eggs, and then they feed again. The time it takes them to go through that cycle of their life, that also speeds up the, the higher the temperatures. So both of those factors should actually give you more mosquitoes the higher the temperatures. However, at the same time, the warmer the temperatures, the shorter mosquito lifespans are. And so you actually have this balancing effect where really, really hot temperatures will actually kill mosquitoes very quickly, and that can actually give you fewer mosquitoes. So uh, we think, based on a lot of laboratory studies and some field data, that the relationship between mosquito abundance and temperature is actually nonlinear. So it increases from cold to warm, Mm -hmm. but when it goes from warm to too hot, it actually will decrease after that. Oh, very interesting. Now, are are these findings only applicable to these geographic areas that you studied, or can it be extrapolated to other areas of the U.S.? So there are parts of this that I think we think are probably more general than just just these three study areas, and there's other parts of this that are uh, you would need local data to be especially confident. So we do know that DDT was used on a very, very wide spatial scale, including much of the U.S., um, substantial parts of Europe, and even other parts of other countries and other continents as well. So we believe that the influence of DDT on mosquito populations and probably other insects as well was quite large. Um, the exact amount, the exact kind of you know quantitative relationships, well, you'd need to have local data to assess that. But the idea that the use of DDT could have been a major driving variable in terms of mosquito populations, um, almost at a global scale, we feel relatively confident in that. And in fact, there are other studies that support this um, in a number of different places. So, um, so we believe that conclusion is probably relatively robust outside of our study areas. In addition, we do know that land use has an enormous impact on mosquito communities globally right. with the large caveat that, as you mentioned earlier, um, quite accurately, some mosquito species benefit from urbanization and some mosquito species actually do quite poorly with urbanization. So um, we mentioned briefly that the two Zika virus mosquitoes that people focus on the most, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, they do quite well with urbanization. In contrast, there are many mosquitoes that do best in natural habitats, so forests or um, wetlands, things like that. When those forests or wetlands are um, cleared and you put in either, say, a cornfield or a city, then those mosquitoes will actually go away. So the changes in mosquito populations, while we uh, believe we have strong evidence to suggest that you will see large changes in mosquito populations, whether overall total mosquito populations will go up or down will depend on the individual species themselves. Okay. Um, And let me go ahead and close with this question. This is getting a little bit off topic, but since you're an ecologist, I really wanted to ask you this question. Um, I think DDT is one of the greatest things that ever happened in public health. And as an ecologist, I want to get your thoughts on DDT. Um, Do you think that the ban uh, has been wise given the enormous number of lives it saved over that period of time? So I think that's a fair question, and I think what most of the people that are in public health think is that uh, – let me take one step back. So DDT DDT was actually used for a number of different um, applications. Um, One of the the primary use, actually the dominant use across large uh, aspects of the landscape, was actually for agriculture. And so um, so – the, you know, basically as an insecticide to basically give us, uh, you know, less insect damage to our crops. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the many effects that some of your uh, listeners will be familiar with in terms of the effects on ecosystems, um, birds, egg thinning of birds, uh, sorry, thinning of birds, eggshells, things like that, that were pretty traumatic and led to, you know, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring and things like that. Those effects, um, are primarily caused by the use of DDT for agricultural purposes. In contrast, the use of DDT for either mosquito control um, and especially for mosquito control inside people's houses, which is actually still done in a number of parts of the world, could probably be done in limited ways um, with relatively small impacts on the environment um, and still have significant public health advantages. And so there have been a number of scientists um, and public health uh, practitioners that have lobbied for using DDT for, for example, indoor residual spraying, which is basically where you try to kill the mosquitoes that are on the insides of your house. Right, which they allow in some countries in Africa now. Exactly. And yeah. so species like Aedes aegypti, which is the dominant vector for um, Zika virus in many places, as well as many other important diseases like dengue virus, yellow fever, sure. um, that's a species that really likes to spend most of its time in your house. And so one could use DDT to kill that mosquito without ever influencing the ecosystem outside your house because you wouldn't actually spray it outside. So I think that's a public health application that could be done with relatively small ecological impacts. And there are many public health practitioners that have argued for that case. And I think that's certainly a possibility. In contrast, I think there's 
relatively widespread uh, scientific consensus and support for not using DDT in a widespread way for agricultural purposes because of the enormous impacts on entire ecosystems. Mm, fair enough. Okay. Well, it was a very interesting study. That's why I wanted you on. It was uh, titled Anthropogenic Impacts on Mosquito Populations in North America Over the Past Century. And it was published in the journal Nature Communications. And I will link to it on the website when I publish the podcast on Monday. And again, Thank you, Dr. Marm Kilpatrick, for your time and expertise, sir. Thank you. It's been enjoyable. You bet. Okay. Well, 